In Arizona, we've had decades of drought. So we're at Carnero Lake, or more specifically, the what used to be the lake bottom of Carnero Lake. As you can see, it's, it's pretty dry right now. The signs are everywhere, and the data are clear. Arizona's been in a cycle of drought for more than 20 years. We went, you know, nearly 18 months recently without really measurable precipitation on the ground. These long dry spells are threatening some of Arizona's most iconic places. This has been something that we've been very afraid of for at least the past decade. One of the things that we're certainly seeing with the drier conditions we've had in the last couple of decades is the increase in invasive species and the increase in wildfire. As a fisheries biologist in the Southwest, drought is constantly on my mind. And if we're not getting water, it's gonna make managing fish really, really tough. Drought is tough on all wildlife. You get lower reproduction because the females that are pregnant just don't have the nutrition they need to, to produce healthy fawns and healthy calves. But also with those dry conditions, animals are just poor condition overall. So there's a lot of things that, that can increase their mortality during those drought periods. One year of, of good rainfall is not gonna make up for 30 years of drought. It's a challenge for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, which conserves and protects more than 800 species. Drought is definitely an issue for, for our job as frog biologists. Drought has always been a factor in wildlife management, but the severity of drought in recent years has really raised the stakes. It's somewhere between business as usual and being super concerned. The Game and Fish Commission responded by making planning for drought a priority. And there's a lot of discussion about how to prepare for this trend in the future and, and, and being more resilient to these dry periods. And there's a lot of things that the department can do, especially in collaboration with other agencies. Like delivering water to wildlife, it's something Game and Fish has done since the 1950s. Today, the agency manages about 3,000 wildlife waters, including man-made catchments that collect and store rainwater. And when we get into a dry situation where there's not much rainfall to recharge those, we've got water trucks, we've got a whole system where we have for decades been hauling water, and we'll haul a couple million gallons of water every year to recharge those water sources throughout that wildlife habitat. It's expensive, and because Game and Fish gets no financial support from state general fund tax dollars, it appreciates people's donations through sendwater.org. It's been great to have the, the public help us help wildlife and, and provide them with water during those dry times. All species, even our desert adapted animals, are affected by drought, but smaller birds and mammals often feel it first. Uh, with something like quail, if you get these good stretches or, or bad stretches of, of drought, they can suffer. You know, in a good year, in a wet year, you're going to see lots of quail on the ground. In a dry year, you're going to see fewer quail on the ground. Larissa Harding, the statewide small game program manager for Game and Fish, is counting the breeding calls of Gamble's quail. What that means is that we go out every spring and we count the number of male breeding calls that we hear. We have usually a 20 mile transect uh, that we drive and we stop every mile of that transect and listen for three minutes and count as many of those calls as we hear. It's a pretty good indicator of future breeding activity and overall population health. And, you know, we do try to improve habitats, enhance habitats. Habitat restoration for some animals includes modifying fences. By replacing the lowest strand of a barbed wire fence with smooth wire, pronghorn can safely slip beneath it. Movement is, is key because in dry periods, they may not have the water hole that they've always had. So anything we can do to facilitate more connectivity across the landscape and more habitat connectedness is always a good thing to do when we talk about being more resilient to these drought periods. Well, we are trying to conserve and protect your cow leopard frogs. We're trying to get populations back on the landscape across the range in Arizona. And the habitat restoration that we do is essentially trying to increase permanency and surface area of water. Spring-fed waters, once thought to be permanent, were going dry. 
By restoring springs, cleaning sediment out of ponds and stock tanks, or adding a liner, biologists are making habitat more reliable for endangered Shirakawa leopard frogs. Just, you know, ensuring that we will have that water there. And that's going to be good for the frog. It's also going to be good for elk, turkey, bear. Water is good for all wildlife. 38. It's absolutely critical for the little Colorado spine dace. This tiny fish is a threatened species that's native to Arizona. One of the things we're concerned about with the conditions being so dry over the past few years is that, one, the site has water, and two, that, that the fish are still persisting in spite of the, the dry conditions that the state's been exposed to the last few years. Back in 2020, this spine dace habitat dried completely. And we were able to get in there and conduct a salvage of those fish, and we're able to move them to another location. Biologists have been moving these fish into new habitat ever since the early 2000s when they existed in just one stream that was in danger of going dry. From uh, worrying about the species standpoint, it's less worrisome now because we have them in more places, but the flip side of that coin is things are drier. We're on this drying trend, you know, it's kind of scary. Oh, there's one right there. Fisheries biologist Zach Beard was That's thrilled right to find Gila trout in this recovery stream. It's always a great feeling to see that they're holding on several years after you put them here. He oversees the conservation of Arizona's native Apache and Gila trout. Both species are listed as threatened, and drought is a serious challenge to their recovery. The snow is what we really need. The last few years, we just have not been getting it. I mean, having snow built up that can slowly melt off into the streams helps recharge the groundwater, which feeds a lot of these streams, but it also helps keep these streams at a lot cooler temperatures well into the hot summer, um, which is great for native trout. They don't like warm stream temperatures. It really makes things tough on them. Wildfires are one of the biggest threats to native trout. Erosion and flooding that occurs after a big fire washes toxic ash into streams that kills fish, and it can take years for habitat to recover. We get quite a few populations out on the landscape, and then every few years a fire comes along and takes out a whole bunch of them, and it can be really disheartening at times, but we have to realize that if we don't keep going, these fish will probably go extinct and they, they won't be here anymore. Things have changed a lot, especially with water quality. Ryan Fometh is the aquatic program manager for Game and Fish in Pine Top. Even two years ago, you know, before we had these really dry winters, we would be standing in maybe three feet of water. Carnero Lake in the White Mountains is critically low after several years of below average snow. This is definitely the extreme example, and that's just because this lake was never very deep. It was basically eight feet deep. But you can see this same phenomenon with these low water levels at almost every fishery on the east side of the White Mountains. So, you know, Big Lake is another great example. It's down probably close to seven feet. Only one of three boat ramps is usable, and it's been extended several times to keep up with the receding shoreline. But launching a boat here is far from ideal. Crescent Lake used to be one of our most important fisheries in the whole state. Due to water quality and quantity issues, it's very difficult to have a fish survive a year in Crescent Lake right now. When lakes get low, they get warmer and water quality declines. Game and fish won't stock these lakes when conditions are poor. It hasn't stocked Crescent Lake since 2019, and it didn't stock Carnero Lake in 2021 and 22. We have never not been able to stock two years in a row. There's still good fishing in the White Mountains, especially during the spring and the fall when water temperatures are cooler. And up north at Lake Powell, fishing is strong, even though the lake dropped to historic lows in 2022. But we have areas in this lake that are two to 300 foot deep still. So I've been out here on the lake September of 2020 was my first year, so two years now. In just that short amount of time, wildlife manager Abby Federn has seen some pretty big changes. The water was sitting right above where that white um, container unit is sitting. 
And so this whole dock, everything was up about 40 to 50 feet. So Glen Canyon Dam is right behind me. Um, it's an electrical dam, that's what it produces. When I started here, the water was probably about 50 feet higher than it is right now. Historically, it's where that white line used to be. The lake's annual inflow has been below average for most of the last 20 years. The main issue for anglers and for recreators is lake access. It's just we only have one main ramp right now for people to retrieve and launch their vessels. It's a problem, but the greater concern is on the other side of the dam. We're now on the downstream side of Glen Canyon Dam. The Colorado River runs about 250 miles from Lake Powell upstream of there down to Lake Mead. And while all of the changes are very apparent up on Powell with the big white bathtub ring around it, down here the changes are far more subtle but far more important to fish. Scott Rogers is a fisheries biologist who spent much of his career working on the Colorado River. The first 15 miles below the dam is a blue ribbon rainbow trout fishery known as Lee's Ferry. Further downstream is important habitat for native fish, including the threatened humpback chub. We've had really remarkably special temperatures in here, in a narrow band of about five degrees. These were temperatures that were cold enough in the upper part here for rainbow trout. They were warm enough for native fish downstream, like the humpback chub, but they weren't quite warm enough for species like smallmouth bass, which are really bad for both the sport fishery and the native fish downstream, um, to reproduce in this area. So it, it was just, it was a perfect narrow band of temperatures. Non-native smallmouth bass are aggressive predators that live in Lake Powell. They've passed through the dam before, but the river was always too cold for them to reproduce. Historically, it was cold water from the depths of Lake Powell that flowed through the dam's penstocks and into the Colorado River. Now, the lake is so low that those pipes are filling with warmer water near the surface of the lake. As a result, river temperatures are rising. Close to 68 degrees, or potentially even 70 in the near future, those are temperatures that are really bad for trout up here in the upper part of the river. And they're also warm enough that any smallmouth bass that gets entrained in the dam and comes through can spawn. And, and if we build a large population of smallmouth bass in the Colorado River, it will have huge impacts specifically to the native fish downstream. In July of 2022, National Park Service biologists made an alarming discovery. They caught three juvenile smallmouth bass, each about two centimeters long, just a few miles below the dam. And so there's a really good indication that there was at least some spawning in an area called the slough here in the Lee's Ferry Reach. We were afraid of it for years, but now we've arrived. Once smallmouth bass are established in the river, it will be extremely difficult to get rid of them. And um, we will do all that we can with nets and electroshocking and some type of mechanical removal to, to remove those fish. But you have to keep the water cold. That's pretty much the only solution. But we try to stay as optimistic as we can and we're looking for the next solution around every corner. All across Arizona, game and fish biologists and their partners are doing their best to find creative solutions to some very serious problems caused by drought. The message isn't, we got it all under control and everything's fine, but that we have a lot of tools at our disposal and we're, we're collaborating with a lot of people to work hard to continually adapt to these changing conditions. And, and that's what we do as a wildlife agency. To use the biology of the species and the biology of the landscape and, and what we know of good science to try to manage wildlife in the best way we can. Mm -hmm.